Writing good multiple choice questions. Let's go ahead and just jump right in. This is uh, what uh, the writer of a textbook on education said. The typical multiple choice question item author is a medical expert with time constraints, and that's certainly all of us, and a lack of formal education in state-of-the-art test item writing principles, and that pretty much is the definition of everybody in this room. I certainly had no idea how to do this when the ABR called six years ago and said, we're putting together this thing called maintenance of certification, and we would like you to run the GI section of this maintenance of certification. And I said, well, what exactly is it? What, you know, what do you want? It was kind of like, we'll figure it out as we go along. You know, six years ago, there just wasn't any template to follow. So why, did we, why are we even talking about CME questions? Why are we even looking at this? Is it even a problem? So several, a couple years back, we, looked, we just took a random month. We took January of 2013. We looked at radiographics, radiology, and the AJR. We just looked at, looked at all the CME questions from that month, random choice. If you go back and look at the rules that education people use to make their questions, 43% of our CME questions were flawed, were not, not appropriate questions. So you know, almost half our questions in our major journal CME were not kosher. So what's the story with bad questions? Why do we even care about it for CME or the boards or anything else? Well, bad questions, as you can guess, reduce the reliability of your test, and their failure rate is about 25% higher than if you follow the rules. So clearly, you're disadvantaging the test takers by doing it. So the problem with bad questions is they take you away from what you should be testing. You don't want to be testing minutia and, and recall of dopey you know, minor facts. You don't want to, te uh, to uh, test their test-taking ability, how savvy they are at taking an examination. You don't want to make it a reading test, and for those of us in radiology, you don't want to make it an eye test. The testing situation is not where to hone your eye skills, okay? That doesn't belong there. So bad questions take you away from all the good things that you ought to be doing testing. And probably more importantly, the ABR changed things so that all self-assessment CME is now equal to a SAM. Well, what, what's that mean? Who cares? So that means when a regulatory body says, let me look at how you maintain certification for your, for your folks, our SACME those questions are going to be what they look at. So if they look at them and say, 43% of your questions don't even follow the rules that, you know, that, that education people use to write questions, it just doesn't look good and it's not appropriate. So we ought to be making good questions because people are looking. For me personally, the most important reason is so that you don't get called out by a malcontent on Aunt Minnie. And that's exactly what happened to me. So here's what Uncle Mo said back in, uh, let's see, when was it? In t uh, 2011. Same old uh, crap. Just took my 10-year research exam. Why do they insist on uh, testing on crap that you never, ever see in practice? Gotta love the academics who wrote the test. Guess that they want to feel that they are smarter than everyone else. So we learned from that, went back to the drawing board, looked at the questions that we had written, and I, I hope over the six years we got better, but I, you know, that, that smarted, I'm not gonna lie. Okay, so what makes a multiple choice question? You sit down, you finish your radiographics article, you're getting ready to do your SACME, what do I have to do? The first thing you have to decide, what you're testing on, the, the, the concept that you're, question, uh, you're testing. Is it relevant? Will the test takers think that this is a thing I should be testing on? This is called face validity. In other words, on its face, is this something that I should know for daily practice or whatever, you know, whatever your test takers think is germane? They're the judges of face validity. So, you know, Uncle Mo with his criticism was right. He said, look, I don't see this in practice, and you know, DeSantis thinks that I should know the Carmen meniscus sign, but I'm never gonna see it anymore, so I don't care about the Carmen meniscus sign. So it's my thinking versus the test takers thinking. So if you ask yourself, all right, so who should be the judge then of, of relevance? Well, it has to be both. In other words, he or she has to think it's relevant, and I have to think, yes, it's big enough deal for me to test you on it. So we have to meet in the middle somewhere. So when you're sitting down, the first thing you should say is, is Joe or Jane Sixpack going to think this is a thing they should be tested on? Now that said, you have to feel like you have the license to test important facts. So for me, you know, what contrast do I give if I think the esophagus is perforated? Well, they ought to know water-soluble is where you're going to start. 
What's the enhancement pattern if you think something is a hepatocellular carcinoma? You just have to know that. Can you Google it? Yes. But this is something that you would expect a radiologist to know. So you can't be afraid to test those because, oh, my God, that's recall. It might be minutiae. You, you, you have to decide whether it's minutia or not. That's part of your role. Okay, you decided it's relevant. Now, what are you going to do? How are you going to construct your question? Okay, the first thing you have to do is to write a good stem. What's a stem? The stem is the question part of the question. Now, it does not need to be an elaborate thing. So by far, most of what we did was pick a terrific image, like this big cricopharyngeal bar, and say, what's the most likely diagnosis? Very simple. And for a SAM or SACME, this is a great way to do it. You have to keep it focused. OK, what do I mean? The central idea of the question should be in the stem. This is the single most important slide not only of my lecture, but of the entire day. There, I said it. This is a big deal. When you ask a question, the concept, the central idea should be in the question part of the question. So let's look at some bad ones and learn from them. Which of the following is true regarding... You read that and you go, I, don't, I have no idea. Which, which way does he or she want me to go? I have no idea. It is correct that you don't know what they're asking. You have no clue where they're going with this. So it just turns into four unrelated true-false questions that may or may not have anything to do with each other, and so you end off in all sorts of disparate tangents. And we'll see this in a while. This is a mortal sin, the question harpies at the ABR. They will really ding you on this one. Um, they, they, um, e and even more than them, if you look at any of the education textbooks, this is the most common fault and the biggest deal. So that's the one we have to work hard to avoid. Okay, those are the bad stems. Let's look at some good stems. What segment of the small bowel is most frequently involved by lymphoma? You either know it's a duodenum jejunum or ileum, or you don't. You read that, and you know what I want you to know, and you either know it or you don't. What mechanism of injury is most frequent cause of a Jefferson fracture? You know it's axial loading, or you don't. But the point is, after you read that question, you know what I want you to know. This is how you tell whether your stem is focused or not. Put your hand over the options. Can you still answer the question? Now, this doesn't work 100% of the time, and we'll talk about you know, instances where you can fudge, but this is the test that you should do first when you sit down to write the question. All right, so let's take a real-life example from May. Routine whole body MR imaging protocols used to detect skeletal involvement in metastatic cancer or multiple myeloma Let's do the cover test. I have no idea what he wants me to know. I don't have a clue where he's taking me, what he views as relevant. I have no idea. So you can see why a test taker would be frustrated, uh, you know, looking at this and saying, you know, now I'm going to read these four things and, you know, hope one of them makes sense, even though the four of them may or may not have anything to do with each other. You're left with a bunch of questions. So, of course, it is an unfocused stem. Okay, so... Let's take a look at those RSNA uh, instructions to authors. And uh, let's just say that if you want to find them, if you Google my name, there's a radiographics article that has them. So, you know, an author near and dear to my heart sent these to all the RSNA authors. Well, what does it say? The stem should be focused. That is, contain the main idea of the question, use the cover test. Okay, so that's what they're reading. Here is an example of a focused stem. Authors, what is the most common site of hematogenous metastases from colon cancer? You know it's the liver or you don't. And an unfocused stem, which of the following is true regarding autoimmune pancreatitis? You have no idea where I'm going. Okay, so let's take a look at how they took my advice. I picked three CME articles from radiographics. Which of the following statements best describes digital breast tomography? Which of the following statements most accurately describes retroperitoneal fasciitis? No idea. Which of the following statements best characterizes the use of head CT in geriatric trauma? No idea. So despite the fact that the authors have this, it really has not caught on yet. And I would urge you, we made this thing one page so that it takes zero time. It has really good brief examples. So take a look at the thing. It will just save you a world of heartache because it's just so simple and easy and short. Okay, so we got our focus stem that way. We don't want to mess up the test taker with any extraneous info at all. 
No red herrings, just the facts. So, in other words, if you're going to tell me that this 32-year-old woman is on oral contraceptives and has hypotension and chest and abdomen pain, then you better be leading me to a bleeding hepatic adenoma or venous thrombosis in PE. Otherwise, don't tell me she's on oral contraceptives. If you're leading me for a clue, I sort of get it. If it's a complete red herring, leave it off. Don't, don't lead me down that pathway. So let's take a look at another real-life example. So we have numbness of the left side of the lower lip of a 45-year-old man with facial trauma due to a motor vehicle collision. It's most likely due to a fractured mandible with displacement of the blank. Okay, so how about we get rid of all the superfluous information and we just say, if you have a mandibular fracture and numbness of the lower lip, it's most likely caused by displacement of what structure? So we got rid of all the dead weight and when the pressure's on, not so much with CME or SAM, but when you're sitting in a board examination, you just don't want to be thinking about or having to read a bunch of fluff, and we should get rid of it. It's, it's a disservice to the person who's, who's taken the examination. All right, so we got rid of the red herrings. How about the negative constructions? We all see these in every journal article, every CME uh, uh, journal that we have constantly. What finding is not associated with all the following except which of the following is least likely. So it happens to the best of us. This was a question which was submitted to the board for the MOC exam, and you can see it's a big, long thing, and she used, you know, accept here, and so we bagged it because it was, it was negative construction. Nice images, question wasn't bad, but you just don't want to do the negative. Well, why? Well, who cares about negative? Why not use it? They've done uh, studies to look at the number of times people make a mistake because you're in look for the right answer mode, and you've got to flip into look for the wrong answer mode, and a significant minority of time, people just don't make that flip. You put it in red, you put it in capital letters, but it just doesn't register. So there's no reason to do that. Now, we'll talk about some exceptions later on. Simple wording for everything, for when you're just doing a regular question, if you're doing a, a clinical example and you're describing a scenario, you want everything, simple declarative sentences is the way to go if you can at all do it. Don't use like abbreviations or jargon that might be peculiar to your institution, for example, like uh, the patient was bolused with roids. I mean, you, know, you don't want to be doing any nothing. You don't want to be doing that. Okay. You want to make sure that the stem, the question part of the question, and all the choices have the matching grammar. If not, you're giving a clue. So here's another real life example. So in most children aged 12 to 16 years, ulnar variance is positive, negative, neutral, okay. Ulnar variance is no predominant pattern has been, has been observed. Well, it doesn't fit. Whether it's right or wrong, it doesn't fit. So I would, you know, not knowing anything about ulnar variance in children, I would reject it out of hand and say, well, this doesn't answer the question because it's different. And you'll, as we'll, we're going to see, any difference leads your eye to or away from things, and you don't want that to happen. Okay, so you have your super quality stem. Now you're going to do the answers, and you're going to do the distractors. The answer is the right answer. The distractor is the wrong, the wrong answers. The most important thing about your answer is everybody in the room has to agree that it is 100% incontrovertibly true without discussion. Otherwise, in most of our scenarios that we're describing where you're writing questions, you really shouldn't be asking it. If it's cutting edge research, if it's most people think this, you pro it's probably not fair province for you. Okay, so this is an actual case that was submitted to the board for the MOC exam. And this is a patient who has a periappendiceal abscess with an appendicolith there. So the answer that um, the person writing it wanted to give, the key is the answer, and he wants me to say surgery. But we sent this out. We had uh, six people in, the, in our panel. So you send it out, and some people said, well, wait a minute. Maybe they would give uh, antibiotics first, cool it off, and then operate. And other people said, well, wait a minute. Somebody might drain that, then let it cool off with antibiotics and operate. As soon as anybody said anything, we threw the question out because that meant six you know, GI experts, abdominal imaging experts, did not all speak with one voice, and so it got the boot. So consequently, because of that, we now mandate that you have to have a reference for every question because inevitably somebody writes in and says, wait a minute, I thought that some, you know, some, people at our, at some surgeons at our institution want us to drain it first, and you can say, well, yes, but look, the literature supports this, and everybody seems to be of a mind, and here's proof. When you're dealing with the answer, you want to avoid relative terms. For example, often, rarely, frequently. 
they looked at this among test takers. And the word frequently was assumed to be anything from 15 to 75 percent. So consequently, it means anything to anybody, and you, you really shouldn't use it. And in fact, test, you know, savvy test takers know that nebulous terms like that are usually true in a true-false, usually right in a multiple-choice setting. So you don't want to use those sort of nebulous, iffy terms. OK, how about the wrong answers? I personally think that this is the toughest job of all, coming up with three good, nice, reasonable, wrong answers. Now, the RSNA mandates that we use three. I have to be honest and say that the literature says two distractors is probably OK. Uh, in fact, it's pretty much OK. So you know, what you need to know is when you send your paper to radiographics, when you do your SAM for the annual meeting, you got to do three distractors. But in the education real world, they think two distractors is perfectly kosher. OK, they've got to all be reasonable, unless you're doing a joke you know, just to ha ha, throw away, but they should all be reasonable. Let's take a look at a real example sent in to the board for an MOC question. Okay, so we see there's a 16 year old girl. She's in a big time head on motor vehicle, vehicle collision to the extent that she's unresponsive. She has a severe closed head injury and her scalp has been ripped off. Okay, so our, our visual scenario is 16 year old girl, head smashed, scalp ripped off. Unconscious. Okay, that's our picture. So we get a beautiful picture of shock bowel. Couldn't, couldn't be a, a more lovely photograph of shock bowel. So what's the most likely cause of the appearance of the bowel? Okay, A, hypoperfusion. Well, yes, it's shock bowel. It's hypoperfusion. Mesentery laceration, perfectly reasonable. She was just in a big-time auto accident. Mural edema, sure, she could have smashed her abdomen on the dashboard. All perfectly reasonable. Now we come to D, infection. Now, if you look at the scenario that, that the question writer laid out, and we come to D and its infection. Now, you could say, maybe she was driving back from Banff and a giardic beaver pooped in her water. I mean, that's probably possible. But I think most of us would say that that's an implausible choice. And as you, you as we as editors look at more and more of this, this is called the D effect, which is, I have to have three distractors, and I only have two. So I'm going to write down any disease that affects this body part as a D. And so we, in, it was called the question writer running out of gas, and that's exactly what this is. And she's a terrific super radiologist, wonderful question writer, but she ran out of gas. And this was the result. OK, so you've got the plausible distractors. You want to keep them all and the answer. So all the choices should be roughly the same length. OK, I mean, it doesn't need to be to the word. But, you know, in the same ballpark. So this, again, superb radiologist sent this in. So the choices that she gave us were suprapancreatic common, duct bile, common bile duct stones, distal common bile duct inflammatory stricture, I hate to laugh, but and a few air bubbles. That always got me. Sclerosing cholangitis complicated by a polypoid cholangiocarcinoma. So I get these three mega combo answers and D, Maritzi syndrome. Okay, so, and what's the answer? D, Maritzi syndrome. So you have these three huge things and one thing which is one-fifth the length, and that's the right answer. So whether it's right or whether it's wrong, it's an outlier. And you don't want, you should be like an umpire. They should not see you. If they see you, it's a problem. And you're going to see this because it's just so different than, than the others. You want to avoid that. Okay, you've got to keep them focused. So what do I mean? The, the board says avoid non-homologous options, which means just keep them in the same ballpark, the same sorts of things, because you want to try to test a single concept in that question. So again, we're going to uh, the, the lovely lady who sent us these pancreatitis cases. So let's take a look at A, B, C, and D. All right, so we have, does the patient have an elevated white count? All right, so that's a um, lab exam, lab, uh, lab uh, topic. Does the patient have a history of recent pancreatitis? Okay, so that's a medical history. Is the patient on birth control pills? That's a medication history. Is the symptom upper rather than lower abdominal pain? That's running out of gas in D, by the way. Uh, but a uh, physical exam, I don't know. My point is it's four completely different things. So she may as well have just said, do you know anything about pancreatitis? Really is, is how you could synopsize that question because these choices are just so disparate. Let's take a look at uh, radiographics one more time. Again, just a randomly chosen sample. So we have 
Which of the following best describes Brenner tumors? All right, so they're typically benign. Okay, so we have prognosis. They rarely show calcifications, so that's an imaging finding. They represent about 10% of ovarian neoplasm, so that's like prevalence, I guess. And they demonstrate little or no enhancement. That's another imaging finding. So we're just flipping back and forth between random things. And again, it just might, may as well say, what do you know about Brenner tumors? And in fact, if you do the cover test, that's actually what it is. What do you know about Brenner tumors, right? So total flunk of, flunk of, the, uh, uh, Brenner, of the Brenner test, of the uh, cover test as well. Keep them simple, simple, simple. You're going to hear me say this over and over again. One idea in the stem, one idea in the answers. Okay, so here we have this 49-year-old woman who has right upper quadrant pain. So let's see what the question maker says. Gallbladder stone with biliary obstruction. Acute cholecystitis with gallbladder stone. Cholecystitis, that's a calculus. Gallbladder stone without cholecystitis. So why did we toss this question? It's too confusing. Every answer is two things, right? So you could say, well, wait a minute. The first part's right, but the second half isn't right. So maybe that, but over here, I, you don't want him doing that, okay? So you, look at the first one, gallstone with obstruction. Cholecystitis with gallstone. Uh, cholecystitis, that's a calculus. Gallstone without cholecystitis. Every one is a double. It's just too much to think about. Watch out for clues that you don't even put, you know you're putting in, but that savvy test takers do. And one of them is paired, mutually exclusive options in your choices. What am I talking about? Random question from radiographics. Which of the following statements best describes digital breast tomosynthesis acquisition? So I draw your attention to the ones in pink. Multiple low-dose x-ray projection images are obtained in a 15 to 30 degree arc. Multiple low-dose x-ray projection images are obtained in a 360 degree arc. I don't know anything about digital breast tomosynthesis, but I knew that the answer was gonna be one of those two. And it turns out to be A, and I had a 50-50 shot. So I've already gone way past my random, random guess percentage by knowing that mutually exclusive pairs, one of them is almost always the answer. Let's go back to the question that we just looked at about right upper quadrant pain. Let's look at B and D. So D, uh, B rather, Gallbladder stone with cholecystitis, D, gallbladder stone without cholecystitis, and the answer's one of the two again. So knowing nothing but how to take multiple choice exams, I got my chances to 50-50. Can you ever use paired options? Yes, but it's just like poker. You have to have two pair at least. So I just made this question up as an example. So what's the most common site of Crohn's disease? Proximal esophagus, distal esophagus, ascending colon, descending colon. Well, why does this work? It's still a 25% chance of, of guessing the answer because they don't know which of those two mutually uh, exclusive options is the right pair that they should be looking at. So their odds are still 25%. So if you're gonna do it this way, you can. I think it's too much work, so I just don't even bother with uh, mutually exclusive options at all. Other inadvertent clues. The vague maybe terms. They're almost always the right answer. Oh, uh, always and never terms. They're almost always the wrong answer. You don't want to highlight any particular choice. What do I mean by that? Capital letters, abbreviations, parentheses, anything that draws your eyeball to one answer is either a true, is either a red herring or a clue. You don't want to do either of those. Don't draw their attention to anything. And randomize the position of the answer because if you don't know, you guess right. So I personally, none of you is hearing this, I only use A and D for my answers, for my questions. So don't tell your residents. If they get a GI question, it's A or D. Okay, now because we're radiologists, let's talk about um, images. They have to be perfect. If you're gonna test on an image, it's gotta be sterling. It can't be one of those 1959 images that you're apologizing for. It has to be perfect and cropped appropriately. It should be a classic example, unless you're trying to lead them down the path like a thrombose cavernous hemangioma, then it better be discontinuous peripheral enhancement with centripetal filling, period, okay? Classic examples. And readily apparent findings, this is huge. To this day, I can remember sitting in the oral board exam and Dr. Gagatis trying to 
nicely lead me to the rib notching, and for the life of me, I could not see that rib notching, and the sweat was just pouring off me. So that's burned into my brain. I will never give a, an eye test exam. So make sure that it's a readily apparent finding. You want them to spend their ATP thinking and not looking. Do not make it an eye test. This is an actual submission that we got. Okay, this, this was sent in for the GI MOC exam. Any of you, even sitting in the front row, has absolutely no idea what this guy is. And he's a superb clinical radiologist, but he's just a nihilist. He sees the answer in six seconds, and so he, he sends this in and thinks, like, why doesn't everybody see the answer in six seconds? So I'm going to blow it up for you and, and give you a picture. And he decided that this was epiploic appendagitis. Okay? Well, I said, OMG, like that is crazy, way too subtle. You cannot show that on the MOC exam. I wouldn't even show it to the residents, let alone on the MOC exam. Uh, so no way, no eye test. All right, quick review. Keep it relevant. What do I mean? Test what you want them to know. So if it's a SAM, test what you want them to walk out the door saying, I got that point down. That's, that's, then you know it's a, it's a money point that you should be testing on. Keep it clear. The STEM, focus, focus, focus. The cover test and one idea and each of the answers, a single concept. Don't do any tricks. Don't you know, have one longer than the other, shorter than the other. Highlight anything. No clues like the mutually exclusive options. Avoid that. And your images have to be absolutely awesome. Okay, so let's look at real-life examples now. So these are actual questions that were submitted to the board during my six-year tenure from 2006 to 2012. This is the very first case that came to the GI MOC group. This is day one, question one, in 2006. In this patient with dysphagia, what is the most likely explanation of this esophageal appearance? Complicated fundoplication, Barrett's esophagus with a stricture, scleroderma with diverticula, peptic stricture with ulcers, or achalasia with epiphrenic diverticula. Okay, so I sent this out to our six members of the, of the panel, and I uh, compiled all of their responses, and I synthesized it onto one slide. So if you look at this, I mean, you're hard-pressed to find something right with it, but you know, what's wrong with this question? Are the choices too complex? Is it perfect? Is it an unfocused stem? Or are you kidding, it's just barium? Well, I'm not gonna torture you. The answer is, it's two complex choices. Every one of those is at least two concepts. So that is crazy, way too complex, you know, barium aside. So way, 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 um, too, many part, too many moving parts to each section. So way too complex, it got the boot. Okay, here's another one. 50-year-old female underwent an upper gastrointestinal study to evaluate vague abdominal pain. The differential diagnosis includes all the following except, okay, so what's the problem? Negative construction? non-homologous choices, red herring clue, too complex stem. No, it's the accept, right? Okay, so it's a negative construction, so it's going to get the boot automatically. Now, why do I say this is a venial sin and not a mortal sin? What we do is come up with differential diagnoses. So if you say each of the following is in the differential diagnosis of this lesion, except what? So you know, I don't really feel that badly about that negative construction because you're saying I ought to know that um, the only hepatic lesion that I shouldn't be thinking about here is a, is a nice benign cavernous hemangioma. So I think there is some worth to that. So this is heresy, you know. Yes, it's Dr. DeSantis' opinion, period. But I, I really think that sometimes that's the best way to phrase something, you know, if you have to. Don't, don't, don't sweat it. Okay, so that case, same case, came with a second question. Okay, so based on a differential, the patient was evaluated with endoscopic retrograde pancreas, cholangiopancreatography. Which of the following statements is true? So what's the problem? Is that an unfocused stem? We'll go back and see if the, length, the uh, clue lengths were disparate. Was there a mutually exclusive pair? Don't change a thing. Just do the cover test. Don't even look at the other stuff. Which of the following statements is true? Boom, you failed. You failed the cover test, right? There's, there's, you, don't, you have no idea what they're asking. So immediate failure, toss it out the door. Good, you guys are learning. Okay, more to learn, same question. Okay, let's look at B. It's a treatment. Let's look at C. It's a treatment. Let's look at D. It's a treatment. Now let's look at A. 
the patient has an increased risk of developing cholangiocarcinoma. So we have three treatments, one prognosis. What's the answer? A. So you have non-homologous choices with the single outlier being the answer. So your eyeball goes right, right to that one. I got all these three treatments and one thing that isn't. So it's either a red herring or a clue. You may not know which, but the point is your eye is drawn to it. Don't want that. Got the boot. Okay, so there was an additional follow-up question, and there's still more to learn from that. What type of cholidocal cyst does the patient have? Type 1, type 2, type 3, cholidococcal, type 4, or type 5, Crowley's disease? What's the pitfall? Let's take a look at C and E, and let's see what the question harpies at the ABR said. Having further verbiage for options C and E sets them apart. So this is highlighting. You took two of the answers, you made them longer, and you put extra words in there, and one of them is the correct answer. So you've drawn them to one of two choices. You got them down to 50-50 now by highlighting only two of the five choices. Showing me before, but highlighting two of the five choices. All right, let's take a look at another follow-up question. This is our buddy again, same patient with that right upper quadrant pain. So all of the following about acute acalculus cholecystitis are true except, first of all, you know it fails the cover test without even looking at it. You know the except is not kosher because it's a negative construction. So why did we boot this question? Because those negative constructions are a no-no. And Dr. DeSantis had never even heard of white bile, which was one of the answers. And so how could it possibly be relevant? But it turns out that white bile has been known since 1969, so it's Dr. DeSantis' problem and not matters. It really is a relevant question. So that, that flew. And here they are sucking white bile out of the gallbladder. So it, it is real. All right, let's talk about the most important stuff, which you've got to walk out the door with. Number one, relevance. Test what you want them to know. Number two, clarity of focus. All right, one idea. In the stem especially, one idea in each answer and each distractor. Phrase everything positively, okay? The one except, if you're doing a differential, you know, I'm going to forgive you. The question harpies are not as charitable as I, so they might not. I will forgive you. And none of those lazy test maker clues. So you don't want to highlight anything. You don't want to have the, the mutually uh, paired options. None of it. Disparate length, um, grammar. All those clues, don't, don't provide them with any of those. There are some special considerations when you're doing an audience response. So the very first thing you have to say is, who's my audience? Who am I testing? So is it uh, you know, neuroradiology fellows or is it first year residents? And that's gonna obviously put you to your level of, of uh, sophistication, but also to the degree of difficulty that you're gonna show images. Simple and short, just like before, one idea per question. Well, why am I stressing this again? It's critical in the SAM setting because you're sitting in the middle of the Airy Crown Theater and you got 10 seconds to get the answer. You can't be fooling around with combo, combo questions. That's why you should target the big stuff. They only have a short time to learn and to spit back the answer. So it's got to be the money, the money stuff. And groom your images, crop them so that there's absolutely no eye test. It's just too quick to have to be looking around. So because of the brevity, those two things, simple concepts, ease of, of uh, recognition on the, on the images, those two things are really key in the audience response SAM setting. Well, times are changing. And the uh, ABR is now allowing true-false questions for SAMs. The RSNA is holding the line a little bit. Uh, so we allow one true-false question uh, for the SAMs uh, and one true-false question, as best I know, for the CME exercises in radiology and for radiographics. Okay, so they're going to introduce true-false questions. Now, what about them? 99% is the same as with multiple-choice questions. They obviously have to be incontrovertibly true or false, right? Any discussion, then it ain't a true-false question. You throw it out prima facie. Simple language, just the same way as with multiple choice questions. Declarative sentences are best. One idea per question, no different than your stem, no different than your answer, no different than your distractors. Phrase it positively again. Can you imagine a negatively phrased question that's false? I mean, could there be anything more confusing than that? So don't even get involved with that. 
and avoid ex uh, extreme modifiers, the alls and nevers, the nebulous things that may be sometimes because you know the first ones are wrong and the second ones are right, and the test takers know that, well, know that as well. Okay, if you follow these rules, I'm not saying that it'll be a snap, but if you're sharp, you'll love the questions that you come up with and you'll be a star. <laughs>